Carol Marks, A Touch of Gray. We're at Families USA Health Action 2013. And we have the pleasure of talking again to Bob Wiener. And he's National Public Affairs and Issues Strategist. And I last saw you at the Democratic National Convention. Correct. I, I directed the uh, Daily Press Briefing Room at uh, the 2012 convention for the president. And it was a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank but you. You were we, a big part of it. Oh, well. And to have the senior's message was really important for we Democrats as well as the country as a whole. Absolutely, because I am a passionate believer that I want the generations to work together to help each other. No question about it. And we have to do our own lobbying inside our own organizations to make sure that we protect Social Security and Medicare. Uh, Pelosi and Reed told me that, that they, they've, we've, we've done it, but if it wasn't for them, it could have still been in this grand bargain that was a bad bargain. And luckily, we have depleted that so that we're now, the president in the inaugural address said that Social Security and Medicare don't weaken us, they strengthen us, and, the, and people aren't takers, they're makers. That finally is the right message. Absolutely. And I do want to talk to you about something important that was left out of the Affordable Care Act, something that was championed by Senator Edward Kennedy. It was called the Class Act, and it really would have helped people with their long-term care needs, So, and that's so important. So can you tell us about the Class Act that wasn't but should be? Well, let's bring this out of the weeds and into reality. Long-term care is what people desperately need if they have cancer, if they have a disability, if they go into a hospital, if they go into a nursing home. This is something that we are all afraid of and it is anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand dollars a year that will completely obliterate your finances uh, unless you're very wealthy. And it's a debate that, that we all have as to whether we should buy it or not. We all get the flyers. Obama's health bill had it, but he just, he and Sibelius just caved and deleted it. They deleted it as part of the January fiscal cliff bill deal. That, to me, is tragic, that the Republicans, what, they're not going to get old? They, they don't have family that they, they want to have granny in their houses again? They want to make it, they want to go back to that, uh, where granny and your mother and everybody who ultimately gets old and, and finally needs long-term care is going to be in, in your house? That's what we used to have. And, uh, and it's really a, a disastrous and desperate situation that we no longer have the long-term care covered that was in and Roberts even approved in the in, in, in and the Supreme Court approved in Obamacare, but we've taken the waiver and deleted it just like that. So because what can we do? We got a lobby like we did, and where we got uh, uh, reconciliation used, where we went to 50 votes instead of 60 to get the health care bill passed in the first place. A week after the president and Rom and Reed and uh, and the leadership in the in the Senate, uh, Baucus. Uh, had all said, no, we're not going to go to reconciliation, we're going to go to 60. Guess what? A week later, after Radio Row, they went to reconciliation, and with a 50 vote instead of a 60 vote requirement, they found the technical way to get the national health bill passed. That's what we got to do again, Carol. We have to get our listeners to call the White House and to say, restore long-term care. It is outrageous. Call the Hill, 202-224-3121. Call the Hill. Talk to the de your congressman, talk to the Democratic and Republican leadership, call the White House, talk to the president and say, we want long-term care back. What do you mean you took it out as part of the fiscal cliff deal? And if enough pressure comes in on that kind of a thing, then they will have to uh, revisit it because it's still part of the bill. So a little tweak that they did to take it out could be the little tweak that they and did to the put it back. the magic word is reconciliation. No, that no. was what we did with the overall oh, health care bill. But we can't do The that magic word this. is the Class Act. Okay, okay. Yeah. You need to bring it back up. And, you know, talking about long-term care, Medicaid, a lot of people don't realize that that is used to help people pay for their bills when they run out of money in the nursing home. And the Republican House wants to really strip Medicaid in a way from doing that because they certainly are against expanding it. Medicaid. They were against creating it. Arizona was, I remember, the last state in, you know, but every state finally went into it because they get most of the money. I think it's 90%, and so what state's going to not take that deal finally? Same thing here. 
they want to take away the Medicaid option. But the states, even uh, in Florida, Rick Scott said, but if it's the law, we'll do it. If in two years it's still there. He, he was giving himself a window to claim he's under duress, but to actually take the deal and, and expand the Medicaid for the 30 million people that don't have it. That's one of the outstanding achievements. In addition to the donut hole, by the way, right. that's now covered. In addition to no pre-existing conditions. In addition to kids on your plan till you're, uh, till they're 26. Uh, preventive care, colonoscopies, uh, mammograms. Uh, in addition to the fact that insurance companies uh, can uh, have to spend 80% on benefits for people and had to give over a billion dollars out back in checks last year because they were outed for making too much money. That's one of the real great deals of Obamacare. So, but uh, that's that's what has to happen. We 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 have to have people lobby. Absolutely. And of course, there's a lot of hemming and hawing about the debt ceiling. And Since when, when is debt the thing we're worried about, by the way? And by the way, the Republicans created the debt. You know, Keynes said you prime the pump, and we've always had that philosophy as proportion. Our debt proportion now as part of GDP is not as big as it's been in the past. And so uh, we're, we're worried about the wrong thing. I spoke to the London School of Economics after the election, and all the faculty and kids said, I asked, who thinks that austerity is the way to go to solve the fiscal problems, and who thinks that people programs and infrastructure are the way to go. It was 100% people programs and infrastructure priming the economy with actual jobs, not uh, austerity to cut your programs and take things away from people and to, to, to cut the debt. They said that's the wrong solution. And I completely agree with that. And the Library of Congress came out with a study that said that these tax breaks have been bad for productivity. And the Republicans tried to squelch the report, you remember. But uh, they came out with a report that said that, that uh, when you had the Clinton tax breaks, uh, the tax rates which were higher, you had a higher productivity. Uh, you had 23 million jobs and it's surplus. So, you know, I guess it doesn't take a study from the Library of Congress uh, or a rocket scientist in economics to realize that if you take away money from the Treasury, you're not going to have the money for the programs and you're going to create debt. You think? Yes, so. and I wish you were the president and you could just say that, <laughs> and, you know, and it would go out over the air. Cause well, President was, Clinton did say that at no, the convention. I'm talking about President Obama yeah, right. right now because right. that's what needs to be said. Right. Because you know what? Everybody could understand that. Right. Yep. I'm a big believer in you have to talk eighth grade language Absolutely. in the media because then we all understand everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, and that is what gets people energized and can understand it. Right. And that it's in their interest to understand it and not all this myth making that goes on constantly. Is the big words in the Congress just drive me nuts when, when let's talk English guys. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think the Affordable Care Act is a great step in the right direction. Thank God John Roberts found the excuse of calling it a tax to say that it, therefore it has the authority, and then he became the fifth vote. Thank God for that. He found a way to do it. And I think, you know, when you talk about the negotiation and the schmoozing, and I think President Obama is developing a relationship with Roberts, I think had a huge impact on that. I think he did not want to, Roberts did not want to destroy the country and everything that the president was trying to do. And I agree with you. Thank God that it happened. Because I don't even want to think about what would have happened if it hadn't gotten past almost in its entirety by, by the Supreme Court. The, well, uh, what they did was sort of inconsequential. They said, and you have the right not to do the Medicaid, okay, except, right. except that the Medicaid, 90 per, it's the same thing that happened last time. It was voluntary for the states. And then when the states realize that they get 90% of the money, they all take it. Yeah, because money runs everything, does it not? Right. Well, they want people to have health care. They want to make the case that we should privatize everything. But I think in their heart of hearts, people also want everybody to have health care. Why didn't Congress just go ahead and make the Federal Health Employees Act, you know, retroactive for everybody. I mean, that's the best health care plan. You've got lots of choices. It's been in place for many years. You don't have to start something new. Medicare for all. Yeah. You know, I, I did an op-ed in uh, the um, Palm Beach Post, um, Hillary's health care truths, because Hillary's health care bill was better than President Obama's because she did it as basically the public option or Medicare, call it what you want. It was almost virtually single payer. She gave health care to everybody through the federal system. And Obama did it through the private sector because he thought that was the compromise you needed. The only reason you needed that was because he had 53 votes in the Senate and he didn't have 60. So if we had 
figured out earlier that you could do the bill by a 50 vote margin instead of way late in the game we might have gotten that that public option through because the house had passed it you remember or a version of it with some weaknesses by i remember they actually had it as double the rate of medicare they had some some tweaks that they had a compromise to but it was the public option and the senate took it out because they only had 53 votes and not 60. So we weren't that far away from it. And maybe downstream, if we can change the dynamic a little bit in the, in the Congress, we can, we can get to that because people realize that we are paying twice as much as every other country in Europe and around the rest of the world and for... we don't have good health care. And we are over 40th in infant mortality and life expectancy. So those are the definers of, of what your health care is. Republicans come up with some argument about why they're not, but they are. I mean, you know, if you can't live as long and your kids aren't being born as, as, as alive, I mean, those are some kind of important determinants. So, uh, the, and, and we're not as tall. We're now seventh. We used to be first. That's another determinant in terms of who has the best health care, by the way. So... Um, if, uh, if we are spending twice as much and, and being worse than 40th in the world in the quality of our health care, we're doing something desperately wrong, even with Obamacare. You put it right on the target, you know, very, very well said. And, you know, when it comes to Congress, they're always trying to make themselves look good. They well, I don't know about that. They, they do a pretty awful job of it with, with, with trying to shut down the government and, uh, well, and, and, and violating the Constitution, which I, says I, the president has to pay the debts of the United States, and you can't tie it to congressional salaries. Those are well, two provisions right in the Constitution. At, that they were trying to make themselves look good by saying that they would have to give up their salary increases if everything didn't get passed. It's unconstitutional. You know, the, the 14th and 27th provisions of the Constitution uh, the, uh, art, uh, pr amendments are very clear on that point. I did an op-ed saying exactly that, that the, and it, it was in actually The Hill two, day, two days ago. It was, so I invite our listeners to go to The Hill and get my op-ed, Debt Ceiling Games. Court could, I think I, it was something like court could moot the congressional de uh, debt ceiling laws because um, it was... Uh, absolutely uh, against the law. And I interviewed Congressman Conyers, the ranking on judiciary, and I interviewed uh, uh, Jim Clyburn, the third ranking Democrat in, in the House. And I, and I quoted Newt Gingrich, who was former Republican Speaker of the House, who said the debt ceiling is a, de is a dead loser. You cannot use the debt ceiling uh, as, uh, as something, as a wedge. And the minute that the courts would rule, and they would, just like they did on Obamacare. The courts would rule. If the courts rule that the Congress has no authority to stop the debt ceiling once they incur the debts, that's, a con that's contract law. It's basic contract law that you pay your bills. Then it's over. They have no leverage. And that's where we should go so we can get back to determining policy instead of letting the Republicans have the wedge of the debt ceiling to cut Social Security and Medicare. I agree. Do you have anything else that you feel passionate about that you would like to tell our listeners? today only that president obama uh has, has gotten a bad rap from the opponents when he actually has had a rooseveltian kind of presidency and i'm wearing a roosevelt tie to remind myself when you consider what he did of ending the wars in iraq now afghanistan restoring the economy over the republican objections making the american car industry number one taking student loans away from the private sector uh and 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 cutting student interest rates in half and passing national health care all in his first term, and getting bin Laden, which Bush failed at because Obama used intel and got him, uh, and, uh, and taking the world's number one terrorist out. Those are amazing accomplishments, and stopping torture. Those are amazing accomplishments. And in his second term now, we're going after gun control a little bit. We're going after immigration. We're going to protect the economy. We're going to uh, and, and restore jobs uh, with infrastructure. We're going to do uh, a lot of things that, that will continue that kind of a legacy. Ultimately, the historians, except for probably the Republican ones, uh, the historians will have to say this was one of the most remarkable presidencies in our history. And, you know, by wearing a Roosevelt tie with uh, that, that wonderful president on it, you're also saying in difficult times, and this has certainly been a difficult time with wars and terrorists and economic problems, you need a strong president and you need enough government to help the people. You don't need to shrink it. You need to have enough people to get the job done. 
That is exactly right. And you know, Obama's now at 60% popularity. His popularity is rising as, as he gets stronger and stronger in his moral values and his, in his suasion. And that's an important thing. There was a little bit of wimpiness in that, in that first administration of compromising is okay, but not schmoozing the Republicans and giving everything away uh, and, and giving them their... T I don't like the fact that uh, he gave uh, only 1% of, of the Clinton tax uh, rates uh, got back in and 99% are, are still at the Bush rates depleting the money from the Treasury. That kind of compromise should never have been made and didn't need to be made in my view. Now, do you want to give out the telephone number for the White House? Our Again, White, the White House is 202-456-1111 uh, to tell them restore long-term care for seniors. And uh, for the Hill, it's 202-224-3121. And ask for whoever you want, whether it's Majority Leader Reid or your own congressman in the House or the Senate. And, Bob, you have to promise to come back on a touch of gray and keep us in touch and our listeners with what's going on that they should be concerned about and can do something about it because I believe people can be empowered. You are correct, and your show is the way how. L listeners, God call those numbers. <laughs> As I God bless you for all the good things you do. Thanks, Carol, and for you, Thanks. too. You get the message out.